Okay, hi there. Welcome to a micro video. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes to think about approaches to, to deal with the, the market failure caused by plastic pollution. Lots of evidence, of course, about the scale of the plastic pandemic imp impacting on the, the world economy. Just 9% of plastic produced since 1950, over 70 years ago, has been recycled. And there's increasing evidence, of course, about the scale and the depth of the microplastic in the oceans. Uh, not just from plastic bottles, from things like dust and car tires, synthetic textiles. There are an estimated 270,000 tonnes of plastic floating on the surface of the oceans. A recent study has found there's even more plastic below the surface in the middle and the depths of the ocean as well. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, came out with this notable quote based on their research and projections uh, that if current plastic pollution trends continue, the ocean will contain more plastic than fish by 2050. A frightening thought. I'm going to post a link to a rather good uh, economist video, Plastic Pollution, Is It Really That Bad by The Economist? It does provide a kind of useful counterweight uh, to the argument that plastic pollution is necessarily a bad thing, creating externalities in production and consumption. It's a three minute video, it's well worth seeing, and it's uh, definitely worth adding into the, the wider debate. I'll post a link in the comments section of the website. Now, there are many different interventions, of course, that you could use. Keep in mind, if there is a market failure, then there is a first order reason, a first order justification for one or more government interventions in the market to help correct the market failures. Ranging from things like government subsidies, the government could, for example, subsidise alternatives to plastic, for example, paper and compostable materials. Perhaps subsidies for businesses providing increased recycling facilities or bottle delivery uh, uh, services. What we'll look at in this uh, this video is the idea of a ban, banning, for example, single-use plastic bottles and other containers and stirrers and, and cutlery, etc. Quite a few countries have done that. The government uh, and the private sector could increase their investment in waste collection and recycling infrastructure. That's critical to developing a circular economy. The classic solution, of course, is a Pigouvian tax intended to tax the producer of goods and services that create adverse effects, including the, the externalities from plastic bottles and bags. Some people, including Germany, uh, uh, have gone for a customer bottle deposit scheme, which is a direct financial incentive to, uh, to return bottles bought at the supermarket, for example. And uh, increasingly, of course, we start to think about behavioural nudges. Can we use a mixture of economics and psychology to influence the choices that people make about their consumption of items that uh, that contain plastic. Uh, the Dutch often leading the way in terms of uh, what they do. Uh, they're signing a plastic pact with other European countries, committing themselves to increasing the amount of plastic waste that's recycled, more reuse and recycling. South Australia has become the first Australian state, in fact, to bring in a law banning some single-use plastics, including things like cutlery, straws and stirrers, polystyrene cups, bowls and plates, etc. So quite a few countries are now starting to, to take the initiative. Uh, one of the arguments, one of the questions you can sometimes get is, is what will be the, uh, the economics of a ban? So let's say the government decides to ban certain plastic items. And in my, in my lesson uh, this week, I challenged my students to say, well, build me, build me three arguments for the government deciding to ban certain plastic items. Three of the arguments that they came up with, first of all, the ban changes the default behaviour of consumers. So if you ban something, take it away from sight or use, effectively it's a hard nudge. And often changing default behaviour is really hard to do, so that will be a justification. Secondly, a ban encourages businesses in pretty short order to, to invest in and find alternative products such as compostable packaging. Or, if you ban, for example, plastic packaging in supermarkets for fruit and things, they'd have to, to find other ways of displaying and maintaining their fruit and, and vegetable products. A ban also cuts the source of litter off at source in many ways, and that therefore has an externality itself. It reduces the cost of collection and disposal. So in many ways, you can think a ban could be a pretty direct uh, intervention which could have a fairly immediate effect. But of course, you have to evaluate the arguments would an extensive ban on plastic work well again there's some counter arguments i asked my students to think of some counter arguments 
challenge the view that, a, that plastic is necessarily inevitably worse than paper or glass or cotton. Sometimes you have to consider the wider environmental footprint of, of producing and supplying and then using alternatives. A ban might actually reduce tax revenues to the government. The plastic industry, I think, in the UK employs just under 200,000 people. It's a multi-billion pound industry, highly profitable, of course. And if you ban certain types of plastic uh, output, that could bring down the tax revenues to the government and, and cause unemployment to go up. A third argument is, say, well, might there be more effective alternatives than a ban? For example, as we'll look at in a few, a few seconds, should the government intervene in the price mechanism through a pollution tax? Would that be a better, more effective alternative? And fourthly, if you introduce a ban, clearly by force of law, you have to raise the question, who's going to enforce that ban? There will always be compliance and enforcement costs that you have to consider. Well, one of the big alternatives uh, to this growing mountainous problem of uh, plastic pollution is to think about the classic Peguvian pollution tax. External costs damage third parties, but the consumer and the producer don't always have to pay, meaning that the market output, in this case two, uh, Q1, will be too high. And in the case of negative production and consumption externalities from plastic, the market price will therefore be too low. So the main aim of a Peguvian tax, so-called pollution tax or green tax, is to make the polluter pay. Or in other words, and this is a great phrase to use in any assessment, to internalise the externality and try to bring output down closer to a social optimum, which in this case is Q2. So a tax applied to the producer would increase their marginal private costs, would increase their internal costs, shifting MPC up to the green line. And if we get the tax right, if the tax correctly uh, assign, if we assign a tax that correctly captures in the sense of the externalities, then the new equilibrium will be Q2. And the higher price, P2, would reflect the external cost. Now, one of the aims is to correct market failure. A side effect is that the government, of course, would then get some tax revenue. The tax revenue would be P3, P2, or A down to the MPC curve, P3, P2, multiplied by output Q2. So that's the amount of tax revenue the government would get. And a tax on plastic bottles and bags and stirrers and containers could raise quite a bit of revenue for the government. And in theory, that could then be earmarked or hypothecated, devoted to, for example, subsidies to alternatives or to, uh, to invest in research and development or invest in recycling infrastructure. So in theory, in theory, a Peguvian pollution tax could be an effective approach to help reduce some of the market failures associated with plastic pollution. Again, however, you will need to evaluate. First question, of course, is who pays the tax? Is it the producer or the consumer? If you tax the producer and if demand is price inelastic, they will pass on the tax to the consumer. And if demand is price inelastic, then it may take quite a significant tax to have any effect on both price and, and consumer behaviour. Key evaluation point is how are the tax revenues used? Are they used uh, for productive investment in recycling and uh, other other environmentally friendly schemes? Or does that tax revenue just get lost in the big pot of, of general tax? Will a tax cause a shift towards recycling or compost compostable alternatives? Is a tax just one piece in the jigsaw towards moving towards a circular circular economy? Are the alternatives, glass, bottles, paper bags, inevitably better for the environment? The economist video is good on that. And who will bear the burden of the tax most? If you tax plastic used in supermarkets, for example, in food stores and other, other products, would that be a regressive tax? Would, that, would the cost of the tax bear most heavily on lower income families? Perhaps a fundamental rethink is needed. The global tax industry, the plastics industry, is huge. Plastic is universal, it's ubiquitous, it's, it has cross-boundary effects, it, it's very cheap to produce in many countries. Perhaps we need a fundamental rethink about what we use plastic for. And there are certainly certain advantages of using plastic, particularly in terms of uh, food safety, for example. 
Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics, I think, is a superb read for those wanting to explore further the concept of a circular economy. So this issue is not going to go away. Uh, it's one of those great topics that are that's the kind of cutting point of environmental economics, market failure and intervention. It's one that students really get into and think about the different alternatives and their efficacy and, uh, and equitable nature. So I do, I do encourage you to explore further and hopefully this video has been a, a useful introduction to the question of what interventions might be effective in addressing plastic pollution. Okay, thank you very much indeed.